half in the bag. Well, Jay, it's a new year, new us. Literally. What do you mean by that? I don't know. Well, Jay, it's a new year, new us. And now that COVID is officially over, 2023 could be the year that America and the world return to the movie theaters. That's right, Mike. Just look at Avatar 2. It did way better than I was expecting. That's right, Jay. So what other theme park rides are you looking forward to this year? Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, Creed 3, Scream 6, Shazam 2, John Wick 4, Indiana Jones 4, I mean 5, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, Fast and the Furious 27, Dungeons and Dragons, The Super Mario Brothers Movie, The Flash starring Ezra Miller, Transformers 12, Mission Impossible 9, Wonka, Ghostbusters, Aquaman, and more! Well, at least we have Oppenheimer to look forward to. That's right, Mike. Christopher Nolan is one of those rare, actual filmmakers with a singular vision that isn't a puppet of Disney. Well, Jay, you're thinking of Kermit and Miss Piggy. But I understand your point. Nolan is a true filmmaker, very passionate about his art. His next film, Oppenheimer, looks amazing pure cinema. He has all the best Hollywood has to offer at his fingertips. The movie's shot on IMAX film. It has the best locations, the best cast, and of course the best crew, top of the line from all the different departments. Camera operator, photography, sound design, and naturally the best boom operator. In the business, the best the best boom operator in the business. Like the guy that holds the pole with the microphone on it? Yeah. What did you think I meant? I, I mean, I assume that's what you meant because you were talking about people that are involved with the production. Right. Yeah. I would imagine such a high cost production would have the best boom operator in the business. I would think so, yeah. Who's Oppenheimer? <laughs> <laughs> but before we continue into 2023, let's flash back and talk about some movies and TV shows that we watched in 2022. We did one of these halfway through the year and it feels like eight years ago. Yeah. I don't even remember what we would have talked about. Well, Jay, admittedly, I watched many more TV series than I did movies. You recommended many to me. I did. I don't think I've watched any of them. No. Uh, I have a hard time getting into TV shows. I don't know why. You're a movie man, I'm a TV show man. I, I have a hard time picking a movie. Sure. Like, you seem to just, like, I'll put this on and hope for the best. Like, At least I know it'll be over in two hours. A TV show, it's like, oh, do I... Because there's always that thing when someone recommends a TV show to you where they say, you got to get past the first 26 seasons and then it gets really uh, good. Yeah, no, 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 no. Ah. I didn't listen to anyone's advice. I, <laughs> I, I've, I have a list of maybe four, five, six TV shows that I started and maybe got one episode in, one and a half, and I said... I'm out. Yeah. For these reasons, I'm out. That's that's when you have to stop, because yeah. you watch three or four, then you're like, well, I might as well finish it. So, yeah, I have a couple of those, but uh, I did watch a couple movies as well. Uh, I'm sure you did. You want to you wanna start? Well, we both saw X, which is, shockingly, that was this year. But we can talk about X and Pearl together. I don't know if you saw Pearl. I didn't watch Pearl. And my wife, Pearl, next door. I appreciate it. This is interesting to me. This is kind of fascinating. It's very unusual where just a franchise just pops up out of nowhere. Out of order. Out of order, because Pearl is a, a prequel, but just out of someone's Ty West and Mia Goth's just spur of the moment creativity, they're shooting X and they're like, hey, what if we just stayed in New Zealand for a few more weeks and just made a whole other movie? Like, that's so bizarre. That doesn't happen. Um, so I thought that was interesting, and I thought both movies were pretty good. I remember liking X. I, my memory's a little fuzzy on this because it's been a while, but I remember... It came out like January or February, so it was a yeah, while ago. I remember it being sort of like this weird take on like the porn industry, and like then there's like this concept about being desirable and aging and aging is yeah that's the main theme of the movie and then uh yeah I think Cra that, old lady goes crazy 
because no one wants to fuck her anymore. And yeah. so she starts killing young, beautiful people. Right. <laughs> but I remember those, those characters. There's a couple, there's the couple that's like the photography department and sound department. And then there's the main cast. And I remember like developing all those characters. And I thought, oh, this is interesting until it, it kind of becomes like a slasher movie at the end. And it, it, yeah, it turns into, it is kind of a generic slasher movie, but it has that angle of the killer is a, a, an elderly woman. Yeah, youth and beauty and this, this old woman who's jealous of their, their desirability. And it actually, it reminded me of, there's a movie, and I have no idea if Ty West has ever seen or heard of this movie, but there's a movie called, on VHS it was released as Dead Dudes in a House. And it has the alternate title of House on Tombstone Hill. But it's very similar. It's like an 80s super low budget thing. Yeah, a group of kids go to a, a house to fix it up, I think for a sorority or something. But it's in the middle of nowhere, which makes no sense. And then elderly woman kills them one by one. But it's a, a person in old age makeup. And it looks like Spike Jones in the Jackass movies. <laughs> And so Mia Goth has two parts in this. She's the young girl, uh, wants to be a star. And then Pearl's the elderly woman who's kind of jealous of uh, her ambition because Pearl is settled and just lives with this cranky old man. They're old. She never uh, reached her ambitions. Oh, so Pearl is the backstory of the old lady. Pearl's the backstory of the old lady. And I liked Pearl more. It's more of like a character study. Because at the end, they tease the Mia Goth character's backstory with her, like, evangelical televangelist father or something. Yeah. I thought it was going to, like, jump back, like, a year and tell her story. I forgot what her character's name was. Well, no, I guess there's going to be a third movie that's about... The, the, the young Mia Goth from X. It's so bizarre that they're doing all this, but it, like I said, like this kind of spur of the moment idea. I can't even keep up with my laundry. But, uh, but I like Pearl more. It's, it's, you know, it takes place in the, like the golden age of cinema era and it's kind of shot that way. It has a sort of technicolor feel to it. Goth, her performance is another one where it's in a horror movie, so it'll get overlooked, but she's fantastic in it. There's a part where she has this really long emotional monologue, and they knew what they got because they never cut away from her. It just holds on her face this entire time. And it's always interesting when you have like a horror movie or like a slasher movie where the protagonist is also the slasher. She fucks a scarecrow in the first five minutes. Nobody told me that. I would have been their opening weekend. Oh, well, there's a cutscene from The Wizard of Oz. Well, that's it has. That's what it, it's kind of uh, uh, those like Busby Berkeley musicals or Wizard of Oz at Old Hollywood. It kind of has that feel to it, in the context of a horror movie. It's interesting. I thought as a like a style exercise, it was really unique. Did you watch Smile? I did watch Smile. I watched it like two weeks ago. I have two things to say about Smile. One, I thought for what it was, it was pretty good. And two, I don't remember a fucking thing about it. I need to find an explanation for what happened. It's smiling at me. Clearly it has similarities to It Follows. It's like... Uh, it, it Follows, The Ring, a it, curse movie. Cur cursed horror is the genre. and um, But with the the new kind of... I don't know, I don't want to call it a trend, but path that some horror movies are taking where uh, it's not just a horror movie, but it has uh, the woven in kind of like a social message or, and this I think was about like mental illness. It is until it stops being about that. And then it just feels like that's sort of tasteless to slap it on. Because the there's end. a monster at the end, yeah. I don't. I don't know how I feel about Kevin Bacon's daughter. Was she the lead? Yeah. I had no idea that was Kevin Bacon's daughter. Her name is like Sorcerer Bacon. Good actress, but not super like um, memorable. That I think, was it Vanity Fair that had that article about Nepo babies? Nepo babies, yeah. And uh, I, felt, I felt compelled to chime in on that. Because uh, I wanted to, I wanted to defend our 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 pal Jack Quaid, who was included in the Nepo Baby. I, I saw he was on the cover. I didn't read the article I was or anything. Like, you know, 
talking to him in real life and hearing some of the things he said about his career and you know he he does not seem to fit into the nepo baby category yeah. like i i i am one where i think that I, I i am not someone who gets upset about nepotism because it exists in almost every industry sure in, in and a guy who runs a plumbing company, the company ends up in the hands of his kid when his kid gets older. Right. You're in charge of the company now, Gus. Yeah, and well and there's also the concept of if if your parents are two talented actors. Mm -hmm. I I I believe in ge genetics and that sort of that sort of stuff can be passed down. Unless you're Tom Hanks. I just got this feeling, man. Um, that this summer is, uh, it's about to be a white boy summer, you know? I mean, let me know if you guys, uh, can vibe with that and, uh, get ready, you know? Well, no, 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 um, uh, Colin Hanks. What's oh, Colin Hanks, yeah, yeah. Actor. I was thinking of the other one. The other one, yeah, no, no, <laughs> it's not, it's not a certainty. Right, and that's, that's when it's distracting. If people complain about nepotism, it's usually because they're watching something and the child of a famous person is in it and they're just awful. Yeah. Then, yeah, I complain about the performance being bad and they only got it because yes. of who their father oh, yeah. was. And, and look at any industry. There's, there's so many cases where so someone only got up to this level because they knew it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's the old uh, adage goes. Mm -hmm. but, but you have like famous musicians who, you know, their, their child ends up being you know, a musician as well, because it's in their blood, or it's, or it's what they grew up around. Yeah. So they pick up a lot of that, like you know, like a plumber would grow up around his plumber dad. Hey, let me show you how to fix this thing up. Here. Or, or it's built into the DNA, nature versus nurture kind of situation, where it's like, either you learn how to, how to, um, you learn about acting. You're in the business. You're in the industry, and your parents do it, and you're sort of just like scooped up. Yeah. Or, or you could take a completely different route. There's, there's for every one nepo baby, there's probably ten. <laughs> children of famous celebrity actors who just go off in their own path. Oh, sure. So you can't just cherry pick and just say like, that's a, that's a nepotism thing. I don't know. It's just, to me, it's like, it's, it, it goes, it's like a case by case basis. Cause then you have someone like Pauly Shore who, who is like the, Oh old, yeah. Mitzi, his mom. Yeah. yeah. Who was, who ran the comedy store. Right. Yeah. And you know, no dude, forget Come it. Back. Well, you do. I didn't it mean it like that. It doesn't matter. That's how I dress. But bro. I didn't mean it like that. I'm sorry. And you're not that old. You're just saying that because you feel bad now because you know the people that like me are going to fuck you, bro. Dude, come on. No, no, no. You want you don't have any friends. What? What you're saying is Pauly Shore is a very funny comedian and he inherited it from being around the comedy store his whole life. Pauly Shore is a negative um, example of nepotism. Yeah. And then there's, you know, positive ones. Like f fucking Kurt Russell. Oh yeah, his son Wyatt Russell, mm -hmm. Kurt Russell's father was also an actor. Yeah, so it's like, shut up. I, I just don't care as long as there's talent behind him. Who gives a shit? You know, it just goes to show. And then you have actors that just come out of nowhere, where their parents are blue collar people, yeah. and they become famous on this, or a famous actor's child just becomes a plumber. It could happen. So I just wanted to make a quick note on that while we talked about Kevin Bacon's daughter. Um, in Smile, which I thought was meh. I, I was just surprised it was a little more like stylish and atmospheric than I was expecting. I was expecting like one of those like crappy Blumhouse movies. See, I, I thought it was fairly like flat and unstylish. I, I would say that is the style. It's very understated and very like, there's lots of ambience to it. I'm not saying it's a great movie. I've forgotten the whole thing. I'm just saying I, I was expecting more of like a... Do you remember like Truth or Dare, the Blumhouse movie? Like yeah. something like that. Cheap movie. I, so I, I thought for what it was, it was okay, but definitely not memorable. Yeah, no, 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 no. I no, mean, no. It, it gets a lot of mileage out of the fact that those people staring at the camera with the creepy smile is creepy looking. <laughs>
movie marred with controversy. Actor and director Olivia Wilde breaking her silence in the custody battle with her ex, Ted Lasso star Jason Sudeikis, and the moment she was served custody papers right there before taking the stage to promote her new film. The moments kept coming inside the theater. Everybody wondering today, and I cannot believe I'm asking this question, did Harry really spit on Chris? You know, I think this might be a bit of a wake-up call for Miss Flo. The fans undecided. But the headlines are everywhere. And uh, but I watch this, uh, and it's fucking terrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's uh, I didn't know. Uh, well, at this point, I knew, but I, I didn't know Harry Styles was acting. Like I'm vaguely familiar with him. Uh, yeah, I know very little about. To me, him. his music is terrible. <laughs> it's like the most like milk toast, boring like like elevator music you could hear. Mm. And I don't. Uh, Everybody likes him because he's a handsome young man who wears grandma's clothes on stage. He's not afraid to wear a dress. And, and, and he's a hip dude, and he was part of the Backstreet Boys or something. <laughs> and, and now he's... He, and I didn't then, realize he was that old. But I watched that whole movie, uh, Dunkirk. Is he in that? And he's in it the oh. whole time. And I, and I saw the end credit. I, I love Dunkirk, um, and I watched it. And, uh, oh, oh he, uh, that was him. Oh, that was that guy from Backstreet Boys. He was in Duck, Dunkirk. Victory is safe and secure. Here you can live the life you deserve. Is it, it's supposed to have some sort of, like, social commentary, right? Yeah, is it, is it like a? It kind of gave me, I didn't see, I think I saw, like, maybe part of a trailer. I don't even think I watched the whole trailer, but I got, like, Stepford Wives yeah. vibes from okay, it. Okay, so spoilers for this. Because I don't care. The time codes for all the movies, yeah, 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 whatever yeah, you want to yeah. skip. Yeah, so if you want to watch Don't Worry, Darling, and you don't want me to spoil it for you, go ahead and skip. Don't worry, darling. Don't worry, darling. Um, yes, the, the name implies the condescension yeah. men put towards women. Don't worry, darling. We'll take care of everything. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a sci-fi kind of movie, hmm. uh, which I didn't expect. I thought it was like a real drama based on the poster. Yeah. You know? So it's this idyllic community where these men go off to work at like a mysterious place. And the wives have very subservient lives where they just vacuum and clean and they're, they're happy. And they, have, they literally have nothing to do but clean their house and they get on this like trolley and it goes into this town and they go shopping and they can just pick out whatever they want, no, no cost. Mm -hmm. And they bring all their clothes home. It's very like demeaning to women. Sure. And it's like very like um, the men control the women's lives and they go off to business things. Yeah. And then they're, the, and so Florence Pugh starts to unravel this and she goes to this, this like secret compound at the top that's supposed to be their work. And it's nothing, it's like this like computer headquarters and she touches it and she's like, ah, her brain gets fried. <laughs> and so. Is she, is she sad the whole time? Not really. Harry Styles, in the movie, he's a successful businessman. But in real life, he's like, like a loser mm -hmm. that sits on, on his computer. And okay. Florence Pugh is like an ER nurse or something who works like 20 hour long shifts and she's miserable. And so he hires this company to put a little headset oh, no. on her eyes. Okay. And then he keep he keeps her alive by like pouring water in her mouth, and every day he like. This is the shocking twist of the movie. This is the shocking twist of the movie. Okay. He, she is living in like essentially the Matrix. <laughs> and there's like they wear like this little headset and those lasers going into their eyes, and they're like, uh. <laughs> and I'm like, so does he. Does she wear a diaper? Does she change a diaper? Does she become atrophied? You're not like, supposed to think about those things. It's a metaphor, Mike. It's a metaphor for, for toxic masculinity, for men not being able to live up to the standards and blah, 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 and wanting to control their women. And it was just so like... Sounds like a very, very original statement. It was so thin. Yeah. And, and it's presented in such a... The first, like, 75% of it is presented in such a... Uh, like a highbrow kind of artistic way. It was, it was intriguing when she was like discovering some of the truths of what's going on and I'm like, oh no. This is gonna lead to nonsense. This, uh, You're gonna J.J. Uh, Abrams I it. was like, is she in a, like a psych ward in a coma or so something like that? I would have like, taken that, but 
it cut, it, there's literally a silly sci-fi device on our head <laughs> and that he's bought and, and he's paid the subscription for. Well, this all sounds very obvious and when it comes to the commentary angle. Oh, yeah. Obvious and blunt. It's very blunt and kind of dumb, and it feels like a very long, like, Twilight Zone episode from the 1950s. Yeah. It doesn't feel, like, like smart or contemporary or, like, you know, what's, what's that show with Elizabeth Moss wearing a nun costume? Oh, Handmaid's Tale. Like, something like that, where it's, like, it, that's a metaphor, similar kind of style. Yeah. I haven't watched it, but I'm vaguely familiar with what they're trying to do with that show, and I think that's probably probably does it smarter. I don't know, I've never seen it, but this is like dumb sci-fi, like, like it's like a one-off next generation episode. It's, it's too lame. It's too like college student screenplay lame. And it's like, ooh, this, this sci-fi premise doesn't hold water. Wesley, just let it go. Yes. Just let yourself go. Relax. Well, speaking of college students, screenplays, and ham-fisted commentary, I watched Glass Onion, the new Ryan Johnson film. Will you explain it to us then, detective? Well, hit me with the deets on uh, Glass Onion. I skipped it. Well, did you? We never I talked about Knives Out. Out. You yeah. never saw Knives Out. I saw it like well after it came out. I feel similar to this that I did to that, which is. It's pretty good, despite Ryan Johnson. I think he's very talented in certain aspects, but specifically the way he writes characters and his humor, it's not his strength, or it's not for me, I guess I should say. Both of these movies have just like really strong casts and he really knows how to construct a scene and get great performances, but man, his characters, it's so ham-fisted. Edward Norton is playing, he's Elon Musk. He's basically just Elon Musk. Mm. And it's interesting because this movie would have been made before the, 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 all the Twitter uh, train wreck nonsense where people are like, wait, is Elon Musk really stupid? You dim-witted, brainless jackass! And this was made before that. And the whole movie, again, spoilers, the whole movie hinges on the fact that Edward Norton's character, who is Elon Musk, is really, really stupid. He puts on an air of knowing what he's talking about, but then they go back through the movie and they show little moments where he's using like words incorrectly or made up words that just sound like big words. So that's kind of the hook of the whole movie. Kate Hudson is in this and her characteristic is that she's dumb. She talks into a lamp thinking it's an Alexa device and that's the joke. But then to make sure you understand the joke, she says, oh, this is just a lamp. Where it's like, his humor is so bad. This can't Shazam, it's a lamp. Whatever, if you're going to make a movie with some sort of social political message, that's fine as long as it doesn't feel so ham-fisted, simplistic, well, and what's kind it about? of pandering. It's a murder mystery. Both of these movies are murder mysteries. Uh, this one takes place on an island, and they're having a murder mystery party, and Daniel Craig shows up because he's the world's greatest detective. And he was supposedly invited, but Edward Norton, who's putting the whole thing on, He's like, wait, I didn't invite you. Who invited you? Why is there an actual detective here? There's a whole scene early on where... Boring. <laughs> now, can I, can I make a segue? Sure. Get out of this glass onion. Okay. I would love to get out of this glass onion. It's not a bad movie, I should say. Uh, the actual, like, story is relatively engaging. It's just the way he writes humor and characters that I find annoying. Uh, let me, let me segue that, uh, and in, into TV. Okay. Cause I saw a thing on the internet and there were two posters and it had white Lotus season two glass onion. And there was a greater than sign. Oh, in between. towards white Lotus. Yes. Um, you, what you're describing. And I was like, whoa, whoa, what? What's glass onion? Now that you describe glass onion, I get the connection. There's another movie we can talk about shortly. Okay. That'll tie in with this as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, just real quick. Uh, if you want a palate cleanser from Glass Onion, go to White Lotus Season 2. We're on a family vacation right now, and it's just the three of us, because all the women in our family hate you. Please. I didn't really care for White Lotus Season 1. I thought it was pretty good. And they're separate stories, right? Both totally seasons? separate stories. Yeah. What, uh, Jennifer Coolidge, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Stifler's mom, yes. uh, is, is 
is on, the only character that transfers over. Okay. She's like this billionaire like heiress, and she's like clueless and, and kind of like zoned out and checked out of life. And so she's playing the Jennifer Coolidge character. She's, yes, she's pretty, <laughs> she's good. But, um, and it has no connection to the first, other than it's the White Lotus is like a trademarked resort. Mm -hmm. The first one takes place in Hawaii and this new one takes place in Italy. So she goes and travels to White Lotus, Italy, mm -hmm. their, their uh, Italian resort. Um, and other than that, it's a completely different story. The first season was kind of about uh, classism. Watching them eat every night makes me like gouge my eyes out. And then it had kind of an ending that just, just kind of seemed like it fell apart. And it was like, I liked it, but I don't get all the praise. But season two, uh, there's always a mystery of, of uh, it starts off with a dead body. Mm -hmm. And you, you want to know who the dead body is at the end. First season, it was one dead body. This one, there's five or six bodies that are floating the shore. Okay. And we were like, and you've got to figure out who the main, who, which one of our main characters may end up dead. Mm -hmm. And it's got many different facets of relationships. There's like cheating. There's there's two prostitutes in there, people using sex to get ahead. There's like there's different couples dynamics. I mean, there's a lot going on. It's all very very well written and performed and it's so like smart mm -hmm. um, based on like how the characters act. There, there are no dumb idiots talking into Do you lamps. get that he's dumb? Right. There's Do you not, get that this character's dumb? There's none of that. It's, it's really like complex and interesting and Aubrey Plaza is really good in it. Everyone's good in it, but uh, I really enjoyed it. It just kind of compounds and there's so much going on. I don't even want to get into it. Well, that's, yeah, that's a case of comparing that to Glass Onion and Knives Out, where you can have a, some sort of message, some sort of commentary, social commentary, social criticism, and it can even be broad. It can even be like in your face and blunt, as long as everything else is well written, yeah. which leads into the menu. You have to try the mouthfeel of the mignonette. Please don't say mouthfeel. Tonight will be madness. Couldn't be more on the nose as far as what they're saying. Rich people are pretentious and don't care. And that's Glass Onion. That's, I'm assuming White Lotus has an element of that. And then the menu also does. Not this season of White Lotus. Okay, the first season. I remember hearing about that with First White season, Lotus. definitely. Not yeah. this one. But, uh, but yeah, and the menu is that same kind of thing. But the premise is so weird that it keeps it entertaining. Yeah, I loved the menu. I thought it was... Maybe one of my favorites this year. It's one of my favorites, year. and it, it was, uh, I didn't realize it, like, I didn't see a trailer. I heard a little bit about it. I kind of, I didn't expect it to be so funny. It's the funniest movie of last year, and it's funny because it's never, like, trying to be, it's the polar opposite of Ryan Johnson. Yeah. It, it's funny because of how serious everyone is taking everything. Yeah. Uh, I saw the trailer and I was I was looking forward to this movie ever since I saw the trailer, and I did not know it was a horror comedy. I, I assumed it was going to end up being some sort of cannibal thing. From the little bit I saw, it's like they're going to turn out that they're eating people, aren't they? Yeah. But that's not where it goes. It, it's it's uh, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. They have it's it takes that uh, pretentious dining culture that exists today. Also the, the cult of personality with the celebrity chefs. Yeah. Clearly they're making fun of uh, Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. Because the logo Hawthorne is the restaurant on the island and the, he's got the H and sort of like the Hell's Kitchen, the HK. With the open kitchen where you can see everybody yeah. cooking. And yeah. And, and you have chef. <laughs> it's like, they're like a cult. Wait, you actually live here, all of you? All of us. Here we are family. It's yeah. great. <laughs> well, that's that's probably whoever got this, whoever wrote this, got this idea from that, or was in the service industry themselves, because they're, it's very like cynical and bitter. Or they've just watched a lot of Gordon Ramsay shows. I yeah. don't know. But you watch those like Hell's Kitchen show, and they're like, yeah, chef, and they're, it's almost like he's like a drill sergeant, and they're like soldiers. And yeah, they'll, they'll die for him, and it, it's so it's very satirical. It's over the top, but it still plays it straight. It doesn't get goofy until the End. But it's so, and it's so, and this is another comparison to Ryan Johnson, it's so like pointed and snarky 
uh, like and sharp witted. With yeah. like when I think of the Ryan Johnson stuff, I just think of like. I think you talked about this when you talked about the Last Jedi. Maybe it was the Plinket review. How he's like he's such a like soft uh, spoken guy. You made a Star Wars movie when he doesn't seem to have any understanding of war, and that's I wish his Knives Out movies were meaner because these are all supposed to be like awful characters. But he's just he he doesn't go for that that edge or that like sharpness to the way he writes the the bad characters so they come off more goofy than mean and here this movie has a mean streak and it totally works oh yeah 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 oh it 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 reminded me of like Willy Wonka a little (laughs) like they get invited to this unique experience and uh they're all like rotten yeah Except they for one. They all have to learn their, except for one. That's, who, yeah. Who, who, you know, the... Uh, who wasn't supposed to be there. With, spoiler alert, um, the, the cheeseburger is is the well, the everlasting gobstopper. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, good. that's good. Where it's like the purity. That's what she... Um, spoilers. <laughs> uh, she, she, she finds that picture of him, and the only time she finds a picture of him... Smiling. We're talking him, meaning the chef, Ray, Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes is great. As um, he's he's clearly like gone mad from dealing with this culture of, of snootiness and trying to re- achieve perfection. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's gone mad. And um, she finds the only picture of him is him smiling when he's making a cheeseburger, when he's like a young man just starting off. Yeah. And so she appeal, she's like, she appeals, she's a, a, an escort. Yeah, they don't. just not involved in this scene at all. And they don't dwell on that a whole lot. There's like a couple lines that kind of mention it offhandedly. Yeah. He's like, he's like, you're a professional. Mm -hmm. You provide a service. And it's like, oh, got it. Because her um, companion is, uh, what's his face? Uh, Nicholas Nicholas Holtz. Holtz. And he shows up. Both of them doing American accents. Neither of them are American. They're both good. Yeah. They're both good. Um, Oh, he's hilarious in this. He's hilarious. She's good in this. but yeah, they show up and sh- she's not on the list. And he specifically designed this dinner, the menu and the dinner party for very specific people that he thinks needs to die. Yeah. And his, and his grand, his grand... Um, grand finale. Grand finale. <laughs> but yeah, and she's just like, she appeals to his inner sense, his inner, inner child, where she's like, I just want a cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. Make it real good. And he's like, oh yeah. Yes, I'm gonna cook you the best cheeseburger ever. And um, you want this because you genuinely want to eat a cheeseburger. You're not trying to impress anyone. You're not, yeah. you're not trying to, to show how like sophisticated you are. And I, I just loved. I was laughing constantly during this. Yeah, which that's I get all that stuff. Yeah. I watch those cooking shows. I like that <laughs> stuff. And that's the aspect of it that I wasn't. I was completely. Maybe other people have talked about it. Yeah. I was so unaware of everything surrounding this movie. So. That was what caught me off guard was just how funny it was. Yeah. The best line where he's like, what, what college did you go to? What school did you go to? Brown. Student loans? No. I'm sorry, you're dying. I love when the food critic lady gets the tiny little emulsion and has a crack <laughs> in it, and then he keeps sending her bigger and bigger. <laughs> it's that, that uh... And again, that's not subtle. Like, it's, it's pretty blunt about what it's saying, but it, it uh... It has the, the humor and the snark uh, and the style, the way the movie's made, to back it up. Yeah. It's, it doesn't feel juvenile. No, no. It feels smartly written. This is mm. insane. I gotta say that the shit around the total absence of the bread is, like, really good. Because that culture has changed. The chef culture has yeah. changed in the last, like, 20, 30 years of the celebrity chef, the rise of the celebrity chef, and um, and that sort of, like, you know, dining has always been, there's been many levels of fancy dining, but now it's just gotten absurd with mm-hmm. the, 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 the liquid nitrogen and then the, the this and that. Well, yeah, and where in this where he's fucking with them, where the, is yeah. it the second course where it's just like condiments? Yes. And no bread? No bread. Bread is the <laughs> food of the poor people. <laughs> and then pretending that this is some sort of brilliant, you yeah. know, second course. Right. Like, you're just you're uh, you're following him along his, his the cult of personality mm-hmm. his, and then even at the end when they're all getting killed they just they can't even stand up for themselves they're so pathetic yeah um, but yeah it's 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 a biting satire that's really fun <laughs> um, of of a very specific kind of 
you know, we, we, we've gone through all the social satire we can. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is nice because there's no, necessarily no big weight to it, no heaviness mm -hmm. than you have with like, I don't know, Me Too or mental illness or whatever, where there's like a real world. It's like, it's something you can kind of sit back and laugh at. Unless, yeah. you're, unless you're a snobby food critic. <laughs> <laughs> who makes their living being a snobby food critic who's, hmm, this is a little fucking offensive. <laughs> but um, if you're just a regular person, even if you enjoy a nice meal, but uh, there, there are people that take it a little too far. <laughs> but uh, yes, great, great film. We're gonna die tonight. Yes, we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you watch Triangle of Sadness? No. Oh. That's sort of a similar type of thing too, right? It's right in between Glass Onion and The Menu, mm. where they're making fun of Rich the Rich. And I'm sure you've seen the trailer. It looks paid for the tickets. Not bad, huh? <laughs> so what do you do? I sell shit. It's, uh, it's funny for most of it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a little like, it's like the menu where it goes over overboard, uh, especially the part where the, the yachts sinking, and they're having this nice dinner, and all these people are so rich, they're just uh, they don't know what's going on. They're all stupid. Mm. Like in the in the trailer, she's asking Woody Harrelson, who plays the captain of the yacht, to clean the sails. Yeah, and he's like, "We don't have sails. This is a motorized vessel." And she's like, well, "Would you clean the sails?" And he's like, <laughs> We'll clean the sails. <laughs> and Woody Harrelson, he's like drunk all the time. And he, just, he just doesn't want anything to do with this. I will buy. I am not a communist. I am not a communist. I am a Marxist. There, there's the Russian, the Russian capitalist. He, he made his money off shit. I sell shit. Literal shit off fertilizer. Okay. And then Woody Harrelson plays the American socialist. And so they, they have this little banter back and forth where they're just like, like throwing quotes at each other. Margaret Thatcher, Karl Marx, they're going back and forth. They're on their phones while the ship's sinking. <laughs> and they're going through the storm and everyone's drunk and then it all falls apart. Um, but the main stars are two young people uh, who are both like, the girl is an influencer, so they got on the boat for free because they're gonna do influencing, mm. taking selfies and what, whatever. But, uh, satire becomes a little too heavy handed mm. and uh, it becomes interesting because the person on the island that ends up taking control of the situation is the head toilet cleaner. But she knows how to like fish, she knows how to start a fire, she knows how to do all the things that none of these people know how to do. Yeah. So she ends up becoming like, um, this little dictator. It's like Lord of the Flies meets Animal Farm. I thought the whole thing was on a boat. Only some of it. Okay. The majority of it is on an island. Hmm. And so it's like about like rationing their food and she, they start following her, she's their leader, and she starts abusing her power. Hmm. Um, she starts having sex with the young guy in the boat to give him like pretzels. Uh, abuse of power, wealth social status, different types of like uh, society, how society like inter uh, operates. Mm -hmm. C communism, capitalism, dictators, dictatorships, like it, it just like boils it down. And I thought this, this, this could work, but it just goes on way too long. Mm. And then the ending is ambiguous to the point of frustration. The, you know how some movies end and you're just like, oh, there's nothing else. Uh, like, I don't know. For me, it was an ambiguous ending that just didn't work because I wanted some kind of closure on it. And it didn't make me think any more about what had happened. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just ended. So uh, there were some good, there were good moments in it. It's a really good direction of actors. Mm -hmm. It has this real like natural quality to all the performances and stuff and, and, and the choices that are made Good director. I liked it well enough. A little disappointed because I was looking forward to that one too. You know what else I'm looking forward to? Go and f an ad break. An ad break.
Help me, Jesus! Uh, uh. Continued in part two.